Okay, here's the uh, thing. You ready? You don't deserve it. <laughs> you come here too much. I did not plan that one. <laughs> okay, so my customary uh, time, this is like my, what, second time I have better recipes. So uh, I have a custom while I'm here. I take selfies, I'm an original selfie person. Um, my first selfie I think I took was in 84 in Hawaii with one of those uh, throwaway cameras. And ever since then, anyone that uses a cell phone, they take selfies with cell phones or you could see it, that's not a real selfie, you're cheating. You gotta do it with a camera. Smile. Perfect, I'll, I'll upload that. Okay, so my name's Steve Rusted. I work for VMware, um, which deals with virtual machines and large servers and cloud. So why am I here? Uh, my, I started out um, working in the embedded world, porting the TimeSys Linux kernel back in 2001 to various boards, ARM, PowerPC, MIPS, um, and I've always still had like a little part of me always loving embedded even though I don't work on embedded anymore. Uh, I still have a bunch of boards laying around that I'll, when I have time, that you know, mythical time thing, uh, free time. Yeah, that, like that really does exist. Uh, I do try to play with it, which I think the last time was maybe like two years ago. Um, but anyway, I'm also the, uh, one of the original developers of the real-time, the preempt RT patch that makes Linux into a, a, actually a hard real-time designed kernel. And a lot of the work that I've done and the stuff I even work to today came from that work. Um, so that's why I'm here. Anyway, uh, let me get started. Uh, my talk today is uh, finding sources of latency um, using various tools. Let's see if this works. Is this thing on? No, we're... <coughs> hmm, why are you not turning on? There we go. So, first thing I do is ask the question, what is latency? Um, I'm assuming everyone here knows that answer. So, according to Wikipedia, we have latency as a time interval between the simulation and response of the, uh, or from more general point of view, a time delay between the cause and effect of some physical change in the system being observed. In other words, it's a time between something needs to be done and the time it actually gets done. And we don't even really have to be uh, an actionable thing. Uh, it could just be the time that something happens to the time that I actually see it happen. So these are latencies. And the, si the length of that latency is important in most, uh, especially embedded worlds and the real-time world. But there is always a latency. Uh, nothing happens instantaneously. Uh, well, maybe if you're dealing with coupling and all that wonderful quantum stuff, maybe it does, but uh, in our world, it does not. So there's always gonna be some sort of lag that we have to deal with. And what real-time systems are worried about is unbounded latency. We have to, we care about worst case scenarios where you could say, hey, it's never gonna be worse than this time. So you can actually put a time frame in, and I was just having a discussion with Alexander earlier about like what defines real time. I always say, I hate the term real time, it should be called deterministic. Uh, what we really want is a deterministic operating system where we know what's the farthest or what's the worst case scenario is gonna be, and we like to measure what those cases are. And then we can design our system saying, okay, if we need 100 microseconds, we should know there'll be no outliers outside that 100 microseconds, but everything's within. You can have one second. There are systems out there that their hard real-time requirement is one second. That's a infinity, you know, basically in our world. But if you can ma make that one second every time and never ha go beyond that one second, that is by definition a hard real-time system. So, but non-real-time systems also care about latency. So why do we care about latency? Obviously for the real times, it's critical. We need to know the worst case. Uh, I was speaking with Alexander about his SD card uh, emulator where he's actually emulate, trying to emulate um, an SD card to the hardware controller and the hardware controller has really, really strict uh, down to what, five microseconds? Two, two microseconds. If something doesn't respond within two microseconds, it considers it a failure and sends out an error report. So he has to have his software basically responding within two microseconds. That is very much a hard real time. Actually, that's just limited. I don't wanna use the term hard, but that's like very, very, very strict latency. And there's ways to do that by 
doing some strange, very, very extreme tricks. Um, but obviously, you know, when we're in an airplane, we may don't need two microseconds, but probably a couple milliseconds. So when you activate your flaps, they, there's not that much of a length of time when the flaps actually change. That could be catastrophic if they don't change. If maybe you change the flaps and it takes a minute before they update. But really, everyone cares about real time. If you say Microsoft Word is a real time operating system, or not operating, uh, application. It may fail a lot, but like I said, if you were hit click A and it took one minute before that A were to show up on your screen, I think that's a failure in the system. You'd throw it away. You'd probably pick up your computer and throw it out the window. Uh, there is actually a real time requirement for all applications. It's just not defined exactly what there is, but there is a threshold. You know, it's probably different for per each person. Some people may have the patience for one minute per letter. If you're really desperate and that's all you have, you ever want to see the movie Mars? Uh, so he had to do things like that. So you know, it was a requirement. Um, so if you do your search results and it takes five minutes to answer, you're going to be, screw it, I'll go, you know, switch to Bing. Um, so basically I said everything is real time. And latencies always add up, so we gotta try to find out where those latencies are. So what's the causes of latencies? It could be the application, the libraries, the operating system, or the hardware. Uh, where, where they is, we wanna find them. So basically, this is what you know, your view looks like. Everyone should know what this is. You, know, you, have your you, know, you have your hardware, there's usually a BIOS of some kind or that connects to the hardware that controls, that could control the kernel, that controls, then you have library on top, then you have application. The application can actually talk straight to you know, talk straight just to a library or it could go right straight to the kernel or in some cases with memory mapping, you, the application could actually talk right to the hardware. But, you know, also the bias could get in the way of all those. So, <clears throat> you can't do better than what the hardware gives you. So the first thing I always, I always tell people when they always say, hey, I found like a, you know, 200 microsecond latency in your system. I'm like, how's your hardware? Um, because if your hardware has a 200 microsecond latency, there's nothing you're going to do that, with your software that's going to make that latency go away. So what we created, and this came from the real-time patch, and it's now an upstream kernel, is something called the hardware latency detector. Um, it's basically, it looks for things like, you know, mostly what we find is, you know, system management interrupts. So when SMIs go up, everyone here familiar with SMIs, uh, usually in ARM boards, do ARM boards have SMIs? Uh, with probably they will, they they're following Intel. So pretty soon, ARM's will be just like Intel. So they're just like saying they're just taking all the crap that Intel ever made. ARM is reproducing. Yeah, it's basically so basically the BIOS or some whatever EFI or whatever it is that could can it stop the operating system from doing something? So really, SMIs aren't. I don't call it hardware. It's BIOS. It's not. It's really programmable. So, but it's still you can't control it from the outside. Uh, or from the operating system. So if the bias is taking over the system, there's nothing you do about it unless you fix the bias. Uh, you, have, you have to worry about fr clock frequencies changing. That could change your cause your latencies. You, know, you do all your tests, fine, because we've done this. And this is where actually when we do stress tests, I sometimes tell people, don't do all your latency checking with a system fully loaded. Try to make it as idle as possible and then run it again. Because what happens sometimes is either the CPU will go to sleep or you have to deal with wake-up latencies, or basically the CPU coming from idle up to full speed, or, the, or maybe they'll say, oh, we could change the frequency down. Because there's been times where we actually have seen this. We stress the system, make all our latencies. We're like, this is beautiful. Then we go out on the board, and like, there's these huge latencies coming up. I'm like, where do these come from? And then when we looked into it, we found out, well, because the system is idle, it's just gone to sleep, and it, it, all the frequencies changed, and everything, all our times became a lot longer. And then you have to worry about cache line bouncing. This is where the application you have to worry about. What, uh, so basically, if you have two, two um, what's it called, uh, CPUs running and two applications that's sharing the same variables, you have to be careful about that because even like uh, read-write locks, read-write locks are horrible because there's a lot of cache line bouncing that they cause. So you may think like, hey, I got two readers. You have one lock. I have, I have you know, a bunch of readers. Let's use a read-write lock. But every time they get the lock, they still have to update a variable. If you're che checking something like that, that can actually cause a huge problem. So here's some tools to measure. So we have to have tools to measure latency. The one thing that we love, and this came from the real-time patch, uh, Thomas Gleichner wrote it, uh, is called cyclic test. 
Very simple application. And we wrote it as, kind of, it's funny because the cyclic test was written as kind of like, hey, let's just test our system. And when we tested the system, it became a very popular tool. I guess no one else really had a cyclic test. We, you'd think that everyone would have written their own cyclic test, but I don't know. This one became the de facto standard, and everyone seems to use it. I've seen cyclic tests showing up all over the place for testing their systems. Um, so basically what cyclic test is, does is this. You know, it just takes a timestamp, says, hey, you know, get time of day. Sleep for, say, 250 microseconds. You could determine what it is. Puts the task to sleep. Interrupt happens. Um, 250 second, uh, mi microseconds happens. There's a delay between when actual you want to wake up to when the timer interrupt goes off. Because a lot of these, uh, I don't know if you really know, um, a lot of the, uh, we always guarantee that you'll wake up at least that long. So if you say, I want to sleep for 250 microseconds, it will not wake you up at 249 microseconds. It has to be at least that time or later but we want to do it as close to 250 microseconds as possible. So we try to wake up the task as quick as, or once 250 microseconds happens, then we can do the interrupt, and then we can wake up the task and run. So the latency for the jitter that we measure, the cyclic test measures, is you know it knows when that 250 microseconds was where it actually wanted to wake up, but then it actually checks, it takes a timestamp to say, hey, uh, when did it happen? We have our interrupt latency, which is kind of small. It's a time that, the, what the interrupt latency I would say is, is the 250 microseconds is when we wanted to go off and when it actually the interrupt went off. And then we have the wake up latency where we woke up the task and then when the, or the task actually got scheduled and ran. I'll post these slides, so. Um, the options that we use, that I usually typically use for cyclic tests, is we set the priority to 80. Uh, we like to make it about 250 microseconds as our s interval, so it'll actually do just do a bunch of nano sleeps for 250 microseconds over and over and over again. Um, dash N is to say use uh, nano sleep. By default, I don't know if they changed this yet, they, they kind of want, I know one of the updates is the changes, they use signals, POSIX signals, but POSIX signals just, it's, if you ever looked at the code of how much it does, the POSIX signal goes in, there's no way you're gonna make any latency with it. It's just so non-deterministic. So we tried to not use that. So dash N is just nano sleep, which is a hard interrupt wake up. Dash A means, okay, we wanna set the affinity of each task. So basically if you have seven C or six or eight CPUs, it'll create eight threads and all eight will be running on a single, every single CPU. Um, dash T is one thread per processor. So dash A, dash T is how it does that. Dash Q, Q that I put in there, you'll see there is just say, don't display anything until I'm done. I hit Control C, then it'll display everything. And the dash D0 is, uh, without the dash D0, it will actually increment by, uh, I think, a default of 500 microseconds or something. So if I, without the dash D, if there's eight tasks for each eight CPUs, the first one will do a bunch of nano sleeps at 250. The next one will do it at like 750. You know, next so or by, or maybe 250 microseconds each time. So it would each task would be sleeping at a different interval. We do, we like them all to be sleeping for only 250 microseconds, which also treats some bugs because um, we've had bugs that when everything wakes up at the same time and wants to run, that could cause uh, scheduling latency. So some of the tools we have, I'm going to basically talk about ftrace since that's what I wrote, and a little bit about locked up. If I, I was going to add perf in there, I, by the time I got done with this presentation, you know, just a couple minutes ago, I realized that, there, well, one, I didn't have time to write it, but two, I think I have too much information in this slide deck anyway. Uh, so the hardware latency detector. So sources of latency, I already mentioned that. What, am I going the right way? Ah, so we have, um, Config hwlat tracer is what you would uh, select in your .config. And when you enable this, I would always say all these, all the tracing tools, I would say go to syskernel tracing. You can mount it that way. It's in a, a, pretty much every uh, distribution has it enabled that I've seen. Uh, the hwlat detector, you may have to compile your kernel with it enabled. Uh, I noticed my Debian kernel didn't have it, so I had to recompile my kernel and boot it up uh, to uh, do some of these tests. And Cat trace, that's where the file is. So when you do that, this is something what you see. So I cd to the directory. You can actually do this on your own, or if you compile the kernel of hwlat detector, you can do this right now on your laptop. Uh, just echo hwlat into current tracer, and then do whatever you want, and then go up and it shows you this in your system. So what I have here is um, an inner and outer loop. So the inner, you'll notice there's inner, and then there's outer numbers. 
Uh, what these determine is the, uh, actually the implementation of what's done. So what, ha what we do is we run a single thread. This is what the, how the implementation of the hardware lat detector works. And all it does is basically does a quick spin with interrupts disabled. So it disables interrupts, does a quick spin, checking timestamps, um, and then after every interval, it'll, it'll switch to another CPU. You could define with the CPU mask uh, which CPUs it should, uh, belongs. There's a documentation in there that talks about this in the Linux kernel. If you go to uh, documentation, trace, hardware lat detector, it'll tell you how to tell you all this information. So, and then when it sees a timestamp, a different timestamp that's bigger than a threshold, then it will show you and it will, it will uh, record it. So basically, it does uh, gets a timestamp. So this explains inner outer. So we do T1 equals timestamp, T2 timestamp. So basically, we call basically read TSC twice in a row, record that. But then we do a loop. But while we're doing the loop, we check, you know, we want to make sure that the loop outside the check is also if SMI comes in that time in between that, we want to catch that as well. So that's the outer loop. The inner loop is the time between T1 and T2. The outer loop is we go down and say if this is our second or, you know, this isn't the first loop because there's nothing to test again. But the, we go through, we, we say was the last timestamp exists? If so, check, you know, T1 minus the last T2 that we did and check that threshold. And if that's greater than, you know, outer, we record it. And on the inner loop, we check, you know, T2 minus T1. And if that's greater than a threshold, we record, or from the last one, record it. And then if it's, uh, after a while, we exit out with the width. So what's the window's width? Um, so we can't just let this thing run forever because it will kill the CPUs. Uh, so we have a window and width. So if you go into your tracing directory, you'll see that there's an HWLAT detector directory with a width and window. Um, that just basically says for every, like for every second, this is all in microseconds. So every second, run for a half second, just doing a spin. So for every half second, it's doing a full spin, taking up your full CPU. Your CPU does not have any access, or you're just doing this loop, and it can't break out. Well, what about NMIs? I mean, we do disable interrupts, but an NMI could go off, and we're not protected against it. Um, we have that covered as well. So we have a hook into the NMI handler. So when it happens, every so often, you might see these, like, oh, NMI happened. This happens that for three microseconds, uh, NMI uh, was recorded. We had one NMI go off in that time frame, and we recorded it at 3M size. So when it happens, we actually should pop it up. Because that doesn't count. You can't blame the hardware if it's NMIs. So what happens if the hardware is not the problem? The kernel, application, how do you know what's what? Um, so you want to look at when you, you could do tracing of your application itself to see whether, you know, delays are in your application or delays are actually in the kernel. Uh, one thing I like to do is this uh, using trace command, which uh, does the tracing of the, or hooks into the tracing of the kernel. Uh, by the way, that I have a bug in trace command when I was doing this. I found out there was a bug. So, uh, I realized that this operation, which says record only this task and all its children, it works well with events, but function tracing doesn't. It only records the parent. It doesn't record the children because it should have uh, set function fork options. So I actually, I had to go manually put in the function fork option. There's, I'm, I'm disclaimer here. The next trace command will have this fixed, but since I actually had to do this, I wanted to show people if they're following this. And this I, there's a bug in the code. So what this is, I said, okay, record cyclic test with all my options, and I'm enabling the function graph tracer with a max depth of one. What it's telling me is I only care about when the first instance of the function graph tracer goes in. So uh, once you go into the kernel, it traces the first function and then ignores everything else until it gets out of that function and comes back out again. So it's not tracing all functions, it's only tracing the entry of the kernel, because that's what I care about. But if you notice something about this, is that it has that, uh, in that red there, it's got a big, big, you know, one micro, oh, millisecond latency. Uh, where did that come from? Well, that's kind of high. And the reason why is because even though it's not only tracing the one function um, that, that gets entered, it's still tracing all other functions because it has all functions tracing, it's just not recording the event. So that has quite a bit of overhead. All that uh, tra function graph tracer is very, very heavyweight. Um, so after I got the record, I did a report and I filtered off a of function graph entry because I only care about entry. And then I cut out all the uh, 
functions. You'll see the, the, what I actually, the output of this later. This thing just says, give me all the functions that it traced. Because if, you, if I only care about what, uh, the, the functions that entered the kernel, I don't, once I run a few tests, I know what those functions are. So I just said, I just, give, me, give me those functions. And then what I do is just filter those functions. So if I just enable those functions, I don't need that max graph equals one anymore. I could have gotten rid of that. But I'm just going to say, I just care about these functions, trace them, and nothing else. And you notice the latencies got better because it's, not, it's only tracing the functions that entered the kernel that I, from my previous tests. Now I only worry about them because I want to see, I just want to worry about their latencies. Um, I plan on updating trace commands so you can actually pass a file, like you just put the function's names in and just pass a file instead of actually having to say dash L function dash L, dash L means the limit, dash L function dash L function name dash L function name. So this is what it looks like when I do a report. So it shows you the latencies of the, in microseconds, or yeah, in microseconds of all the functions that jumped in and these are the functions of page faults. This is when I first started, you'll say, you'll notice mutex unlocked. It's like where that came from, what, but the mutex unlock actually was probably because that was ent after the exec, it probably called the mutex unlock, so that's why it's there. Uh, and I go down here further, I, I did sleep, uh, I enabled all events, so not only that, I also see, or I enabled the syscall events, so I could see which system call, and you can see the nanoseconds in there, and how they took about 247 uh, micro, uh, microseconds each. Um, you might say, well didn't I just say, that the, uh, it will never be shorter than 250, then why that's 247 microseconds? Well, by the time it got into the kernel, time happened, and it calculated, the nano sleep actually says, it looks at when, or um, cyclic test looks at when the next 250 uh, microsecond latency, or the wake up it wants to be, and puts, it actually puts that in it. So it doesn't actually say, 250 each time, it'll actually say, okay, where's the next 250 microseconds? Or it'll say, yeah, give me that time. So then we have the wake-up latency. How much time do I have left? I don't know. I'm, hopefully, uh, I should speed up. Um, the wake-up latency tracer looks at a wake-up. Now, there's two wake-up latency tracers. One's normal wake-up, and then there's a wake-up underscore RT. The difference is wake-up will doesn't care about uh, whether it's a real-time task or non-real-time task, so you'll, it'll, trace, it'll check all tasks. It always looks at the highest priority task, so if it's tracing the highest priority task at the time and another high, higher priority task wakes up and starts, or there's a wake up for a higher priority task, it will throw away the old one and look at only the highest priority task because it only makes sense to look at wake up latencies of the highest priority task because if you have a lower priority task, wakes up, and then a higher priority task wakes up, it will wake up first, and this one will have to wait again. So we don't care about lower priority tasks, we only care about the highest priority task of the system, because that's really will measure the, will give you a good, more accuracy of your wake up latencies. So wake up RT, well the problem is, it measure, it also only records the largest wake up time that it took. So if you run just wake up latency, there could be non real time tasks don't care as much about waking up. So there could actually be a long latency, because the system isn't caring about it as much. <laughs> So it could hide what we want, we care about the RT tasks. So wake up RT will only monitor RT tasks, so it doesn't care about anything that's not. Um, this shows you how to, uh, the, oh yeah. When I do the recording, I, I use trace command record, the tracer for wake up, and then I disable function tracing because function tracing can add a lot of overhead, but I do like events. Events usually don't have much overhead. Well, they used to not have much overhead until we added a lot of events that are in critical paths, and I'll show you that right here. So when I ran this, I enabled the wake-up tracer, ran my tra uh, cyclic tests, and then uh, it, you notice the times got up a little bit. Why is that? Um, wow, one latency it got was, it took uh, 319, you can see up here in the top uh, left corner, uh, it says latency, 319 microseconds, uh, CPU 2, and it was the cyclic test process. And if I go down here, here's the thing. This is what I saw. Uh, this, these are events. And I forgot that we added the IRQ enable disable trace event. Uh, you could turn it off, but I had it enabled in this run. I didn't realize that. So every time interrupts are being enabled and every time interrupts are disabled, we trace it. That could add a bit of overhead. So usually you'd have that turn off or you could, yeah, you wouldn't turn on that event. Uh, or just not compile it into your kernel in the first place. And, but the thing is, this is also a new event. We just added it recently. Uh, we're looking at changing lock depth and having it work with uh, trace events. And it has a little bit of bug, because you notice that the parent is null here. That will be fixed in later kernels. 
it's a new event, so it's not even a regression. So instead of, um, I want to know, if you notice, go back there, it's all raw spin lock. So let's enable, uh, instead of disabling all function tracing, why not trace raw spin locks? And we're, we're already tracing events because I want to see where, what called that guy. So I ran it again. Actually, the events are basically just, uh, the timings are just the same. And then here I got, I could see, oh, the function tracer shows me that it's in the LRU move memory management. It's funny because I actually ran this test twice and I saw a nice, I had all those um, uh, disable enable within wrappers nicely and I said, oh, I could show this, but then I didn't save that output and I went to run it again. Well, the LRU in my machine was just going crazy and I couldn't get rid of this MMLRU activate. Uh, it's been going like, it's, it was always there. And that would have showed me in the first case, oh yeah, it's the MMLRU that's the problem. But the first trace, I didn't have that. So, then we also have to look at latencies caused by when we disable, like we just saw this, this is uh, preemptions, or you know, preemption is disabled, so we wanna look at um, tracing for when preemption and IRQs are disabled. So there's the IRQ off, preempt off, and preempts IRQ off tracers. Uh, IRQ is off only traces when interrupts are off. Preempt tracer only trades when preemption is off, or when we do preempt disable. Preempt IRQ is off basically is the only thing I use because that's basically when things can't schedule. You know, if preemption or IRQs are off. So if you do preempt disable, IRQ disable, preempt enable, IRQ enable, that whole big window will be what you want to trace, not a part of it. So I run this test, I do a show, and this is what I get. And you notice that I'm like, oh, wow. And um, preemption was disabled for quite a long time. Uh, and it was from when a mutex was held. I was like, wait a minute. Mutexes are only called when preemption's enabled. How could it be preempt disabled? Anyone know why this is in, uh, any? OK, who, who here is a kernel developer? We got a few kernel, oh, we got a lot of kernel developers. Anyone have any idea how this could be legit? that a mutex uh, lock had such a long latency with preemption disabled? Adaptive mutexes. Everyone familiar with adaptive mutex? It will spin checking whether or not, it checks need resched, but also it disables preemption, checks need resched, and checks to see if the next process, or, or the owner of the lock is alive, and it'll just sit there kind of like a spin lock until either a scheduling event comes in saying, hey, don't sched. So it actually is, is a condition sched, condition sched in there to get out of the preemption disable. So it's, this is kind of something I'm like, I gotta work on saying, hey, when we have condition sched, don't measure this because condition sched is an issue. So adopt the spin locks, it will spin with preemption disabled, although if, if an interrupt happens, it would actually preempt it um, because it would actually get out. And adaptive spin locks or adaptive mutexes will spin until like a spin lock um, and wait until the uh, owner goes to sleep or releases the lock. That makes things a little bit faster than going through, than just sleeping, and then the owner releases the lock and then you have to wake up again. By the way, I wanted to see where these things were, so if you echo one into sys offset, you get to see, um, it'll give you more information in your output. Um, I already did this slide. I was really, really tired, and I think I have duplicate slides. Oh, trace marker tracing on files. This is where the user space can actually write into the buffer to, to measure things. So trace marker lets you write anything into the ring buffer. Um, tracing on lets you stop tracing or enable tracing. So if the kernel disables tracing, you could re-enable tracing. But uh, this lets you, I tell people to use applications to do this yourself. So we have something like this, with the, which is um, you have your marker write. So you create your two file descriptors. In the beginning, you would open them up if they're available. And you know, I set them to negative one because sometimes they're not there, I just leave them there. So uh, if I run my code on something that doesn't have tracing enabled or I can't get to those files, I don't want to break my code. I want it to run normally, it just won't trace anything. So if it's available and it could write to it, I have it, uh, the two tracing markers, I say okay, I open the files and I have them all ready to write to. So I don't want to open the files 
when I need to, need to write to them. I want them already open at the beginning of the, the function. And then later on, I will say, on the bottom, you'll say they're on error. error. I'll write, you know, hey, I detected a latency. Set tracing to equal zero. So write that. Here's my problem. So you write where the problem happened and then stop tracing. So that way, the ring buffer is over, is over or overwrite ring buffer. So if you don't stop it right away, you may lose the data that you want to trace. So cyclic test has this already built into, the, into its application. It's had it for a long time. And when you do the dash B and give it a number, you say, hey, if my, if my latency is more than 500 microseconds, you know, break. Um, there's more options in there that if you wanted to do, enable uh, events, function tracing, and IRQs off, blah, blah, blah. We could even, do, instead of doing the trace command record that I had before, I could have done, actually just done it with the dash P, dash W, dash W, that's the preempt soft tracer, enable tracers. So the way I do this is I kick off cyclic tests and I run it like, you know, there and then on another screen in another terminal, I'll kick off trace command. Reason why is because cyclic tests still monkeys with it. It used to be that my cyclic tests would enable all the function tracing and all that. I don't want cyclic tests doing the, doing the work. I want to control what I'm doing. So instead of using trace command record, I use trace command start, which will just say, just enable all the tracing and then, you know, be done with it. So what I'm doing is I'm tracing uh, function tracer, but I'm only tracing all lock, anything that has the name lock in it or mutex in it. That's the dash L with the star lock, dash L star, and also all events. And then back on uh, the tracing side, when I hit my latency, you get this thing output. I didn't hit control C here. Uh, it actually hit the 500 microsecond. You see at the bottom, it said, you know, the thread that hit the latency, and there's the value, 560. So, the first thing I do is I'm like, okay, I found my latency. It's recorded in the trace buffers. Um, I save all the text files just in case. So up here I show you how I say co copy the, uh, the trace file I have into some directory. And then for each of the per CPU files, because the, if you didn't know this, uh, the tracing is done in each uh, single CPU. So then uh, you get the data, data per CPU. So I save that as well, just so I have it on hand. But then I extract it with trace command into a trace.dat file, and that gives me full power to analyze everything, because now I have all the data in a single file. It's basically like a database. I can now sort it, filter it, do whatever I want. Um, and also, what I can do is I do a report and search for print. And you'll notice that there, it says trace marker right hit. Hit latency threshold 560 over 500, uh, greater than 500. That's what uh, cyclic test wrote into the ring buffer. Uh, happened on CPU 3. So let's just look at CPU 3. So if you look up in there, I did trace command report, dash L means I want latency information, uh, which is those funny dots, the three dot dot dot, 3D, that, those have mesh special meanings. Uh, dash O parent, which means I want the function tracer to show me the parent, uh, and just give me CPU 3. And this is what I look at when I look at a trace. This is how I uh, determine latencies with the real-time kernel. I, there, uh, with the cyclic test. First thing I do is say, okay, which uh, find the task that failed to wake up, and I found it down at the bottom. You'll see there the threshold. I see the task 15129. And then I go through, I say, oh, where did it, where did it get scheduled in? It got scheduled in, wait, I'm going from the bottom up here. Scheduled in there at, uh, you know, the 95, uh, 958, and the print was 979. You know, that's a bit of a change, but I'm not too worried about that latency because it was a large, it was 500 latency. I go back up, you know, there's a huge, you'll notice, um, let's see, I'm going to go back here. Now we'll start from the top again. Then I go all the way back to the top and I say, okay, where's the hardware, where's the timer that uh, went there? You'll see way up on the top, this is where the nano sleep started. Uh, I found the timer and it uh, where it started the nano sleep and you'll notice that this function um, at the wake up expires, soft expires. Now those numbers there uh, are important. It says, tells you when it wants to wake up. That's the exact number it wants to wake up. If I go to the bottom where it woke up, you'll see where the now is. Now is, here if I want to do the, uh, right, yeah, the now. The now is, yeah, that number, and I subtract the two, it's only one microsecond. So that, the interrupt latency was one microsecond. So that's not where the problem is. It wasn't where the interrupt, the timer went off, it woke up immediately. It was the wake up latency that was the issue. So then I look at, you know, the now, by the way, I, you can look at the now and then look at the timestamp of the actual thing and you could calculate what the tracing times, how the tracing timestamps match with uh, the now. The now is in nanoseconds, the, uh, the tracing is in microseconds, so I just chop off the last three of the, 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 na the nanoseconds and uh, the off, that's the offset is 158,000 microseconds uh, difference in the timestamps. Um, 
And then if I go down, I look at the, uh, where the, oh, where the big jump happened. And, oh, let me just go down. There's the timer went off, and I go down, I found the timer exit. Yeah, the next one is where the, where it woke up. Where's the wake up? I have the wake up there somewhere, I can't find it. Uh, sked switch. Uh, where do I see the wake up? Ah, wake up, I didn't highlight it. I think it's right there. Yeah, there's the wake up. That's where I find the now, and it says the timer. The wake up happened at 4.03, which is not a bad. And shoot, I, you know, I think I copied the wrong thing. I was half asleep when I wrote this, so I didn't actually, I missed the point where I had the big jump. I think, yeah, the vector went off. And oh, you'll see all these functions. Yeah, I think what happened was I found a bunch of, the skid switch, oh, I, did, I, yeah, I didn't record it. Okay, I have to apologize because I didn't record the big jump. There was a big jump there where a lock happened and unlock. I think it was, it was on the RCU read unlock that happened there. So it was preemption was enabled. Oh, but there is, that's when it did wake up. Oh, I know what, I know what the problem is. There was a big jump because it was a, it was a huge thing. Okay, now I have to, my mind's back. Okay, there was no big jump because it was just this whole huge thing. There was no jump. It was just doing all these RCU read locks, unlocks, read locks, unlocks. But if you notice that last number in that latency thing, that last number is the uh, preempt, that's the preempt count. So when that number's anything but zero, or if it's a dot on this thing, it means it can't do preemption. And you notice that number just gets, or well, it's funny, the number actually gets cleared. The end means need, need resket is set, and that's off. So this number actually went to zero, wasn't recorded, and then we had this when the schedule happened, it went back to two. But in here, that's where we where the lock finally says, oh, you could schedule now. And that's because RCU read lock is on this kernel pre disables preemption. So that's this is not a I didn't run this on the real-time kernel. The reason why I didn't run this on the real-time kernel is because I couldn't find any latencies that were worth uh, talking about because we fixed the real-time kernel so well and I, I don't have all my data from my old days so I actually just said I'll just use the preempt kernel and then just debug the latencies there. That's, that shows you how much work we've done and succeeded. <laughs> um, anyway, lock, lock depth, do I have time here or should I wrap up? I think I've probably over time. Should I? I can keep going. Uh, <laughs> no one's telling me so I'll just keep going until you pull me off. What? Oh, next one in five minutes. So I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll speed up. I'm almost done. This is my last. This is my last thing. Great. So, lock stats. I really want to put. Not many people know about lock stats. It's part of LockDep. It's really good because it shows you um, where your contention is between uh, the locks within the kernel. And if I'm, I'm going to skip over there. You can read all the information about it at the bottom there. There's the links about lock stats. But uh, here's the headers. For, it's in the proc. Lock stat file. So when you enable this, you can just, it's already running when you boot up the kernel. You can look at it, but there's also ways to stop it, clear it, reset it, start it up again if you want to run tests. I'm not going to go into that. And how it works is basically when it hits a lock, it, instead of grabbing the lock, it does try lock. So all locks in the kernel do try locks instead of locks and determines do we have, do we have contention or we didn't, do not have contention. If the try lock passed, we say, oh, we got it without contention. If the try lock fails, that means there's contention. So we record it and then we grab the lock normally. And then when we get it, we say, oh, we got it. So here's something that shows you uh, the output uh, in that uh, file, the lock stat file. It shows you... Uh, which lock it was, uh, and you can find it, that shows the address of the locks, and uh, where the locks were mostly grabbed. So it tells you where the locks were, where the contention points are, and which locks you should look at, so maybe you could break up and find. So that's something that's uh, highly recommended uh, to use, but not many people even know about it. How many people have heard of Lockstat before? Yeah, not like one hand. So this is why I'm talking about this, because there's a lot of really good features within the Linux kernel that people don't even know exist. Uh, so that's why this, I threw this in there, was just to let you know. And since it's time to go, I can't talk more about it. So questions? If there's time. I think I have two minutes. One. No questions? OK. No, one question. Do we have a mic? Does that work now? Heads up. Incoming. Well, it's not a question, but uh, I had never heard of Logstat. I've heard of LogDep, and I found it's not uh, Logstat is not enabled in my distribution. So, might uh, be a reason why. Oh no no you would okay LogDep or Logstat is built on top of LogDep. Yeah, LogDep adds a bit of overhead. 
So you'll have no distribute, you'll be no production kernel that runs lockstep. Uh, you don't, I mean, look at that. Even look at the, how it works. You're, you got rid of that, you're doing try locks. It's, it's, this is, and then recording, you know, when you fail. Uh, you don't want that in a production kernel. So this is for when you're debugging or you want to, if you have a problem, you enable this, run your test code, and then look at the stats and say, oh, here's where we got to fix. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, I think it's probably just uh, everyone's overloaded. Or I was just really, really boring. Okay, thank you very much. Is Rena around? We are waiting for the next speaker, in fact. So if you have some more questions, maybe Stephen can answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I can start writing one. <laughs> yes. I'll wrap. Let me do a handstand. I'll get up here. So the question is, uh, if this can work for virtual machines or can the hypervisor lie about it? Um, it's sort of possible to do that. Uh, we've actually had techniques where we actually once, I think, an, uh, one vendor tried to hide the SMIs by changing the timestamps on us. Um, and we had to go in and we actually switched it to doing like more of a get time of day. So we did a wall clock latency thing. And we said, wait a minute, the timestamps were jumping. And we actually confronted them, and they fixed it. Uh, so a hypervisor can, but there's techniques that you can use. If you, if you expect it, we, uh, by default, we don't expect it. And because getting wall time is much more expensive than just getting a timestamp, we don't usually do that unless there's some higher. But most cases, um, that's, it shouldn't, they shouldn't do that. OK. Thank you. Yep. And actually, to do that, they have to trap the, um, the TSC itself. So you could actually kind of, you could use sort of a specter like side channel to determine whether or not by just timestamping, like saying, if it takes a long time to do timestamps, you know that there, there's something fishy going on. What? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, but the thing is, yeah, well, the thing is, yeah, but the thing is, if you're just doing a bunch of read TSCs, if you do a bunch of read TSCs, then look. Oh, your SMI, then you do the change, the offset in there, yes. So, but I'm saying if you're doing a bunch of read TMCs, and then you do get periodically do get times of days, and suddenly there's a skip there. Yeah. So. And but the TSCs don't show the skip.